In the Claude Bernard lecture, we had a masterly exposition from Julie Zirath of the mechanisms by which exercise impacts on diabetes. What we thought we'd do for you now is talk to Donald O'Gorman, who's Associate Professor at Dublin City University, to bring a more clinical aspect uh, to this work. Hello, Donald. Good evening. How are you? Very good, thank you. So uh, how do we interpret uh, the work that Julian Zirath has done into clinical application? And particularly that very vexed question, I guess, of what exactly counts as exercise? Sure. Well, Jolene's work over the years has, has really advanced our knowledge and understanding of how exercise and the mechanisms of exercise um, help in glucose control and glucose uh, metabolism. And fr from the prospect of translating this then into clinical work, there are a number of different factors that ultimately need to be considered. And partly that revolves around the patient and the background of the patient. And we know that within diabetes, the patients are on different types of medication. Um, they also have different durations of diabetes. Um, and all of these factors influence ultimately the, the type of exercise that they undertake and also the responsiveness that they have to exercise and exercise training. One of the things I think we've, we've started to see in, in recent years is the individual responsiveness to exercise. So not everyone responds in the same way. And we, we need to understand that in order to be able to give the best prescription possible uh, to patients that have diabetes, but also uh, for those that are at risk of diabetes to prevent them from going on uh, to develop the disease. Is that genetically <laughs> determined or do you think it's more physiologically determined as in, uh, for instance, it's, uh, uh, how obese someone is or uh, what levels of exercise they've, they've done before? It's probably a mix of a number of those different factors. Um, and it's not something that we fully understand at this time. And this is where a lot of work is being conducted both by the ESD and the ADA in terms of the precision medicine approaches to diabetes, understanding why people respond in different ways. And then also as a result of that, trying to come up with the best treatment and the best management for each individual patient. So it is a mix of both um, and something that we need to spend more time trying to fully understand. I mean, one of the suggestions that Julian Zirath made, which I found very intriguing, was the influence of the circadian clock uh, on all these effects and that they were expecting people who did exercise in the morning to have had an impact. And it actually, it didn't. It made things, it made things worse. But people who did their exercise in the afternoon there was a, a, an impact. So, mm -hmm. it, it, so that's a very intriguing finding. That's, that's correct. And that's been a surprising finding for all of us involved in exercise science and those involved in exercise and diabetes. Um, many of us involved in exercise have conducted research studies over the years in the morning uh, because it is easier to control for uh, different circumstances in testing at that time. But what Julien's work has shown is that exercise in the afternoon is actually more beneficial in terms of glucose metabolism and glucose control. So we have to take these findings and uh, from a clinical perspective, this can now feed into the recommendations that we provide to patients. And I think we'd be careful to say, it's not that we would be saying that exercise in the morning is not good for you, but it does appear that exercise in the afternoon or the evening seems to confer more benefits in terms of glucose control and the management of diabetes. Now, I'm going to drag you back to that question I asked before, but which you dodged, <laughs> which, is, okay, but, which that. is about what counts as exercise. Because I okay. think if you say to the average person, exercise, they immediately think that they're training for, you know, half marathons and, uh, and all of that. But actually, exercise doesn't have to be competitive sport. Well, that's very true. And, um, you know, we, we think about exercise in its traditional way of performing maybe aerobic activity for 30 or 60 minutes nonstop, you know, going for a walk, uh, going for a cycle. Um, and, and that's the traditional approach we've had. But I think exercise in its broader science has expanded quite a lot in, in recent years. And 
even now bringing in elements of resistance exercise is very important. But that too doesn't involve going to a gym. A lot of exercise and resistance training can be done with just your own body weight or would not requiring a lot of specialist um, equipment. But one of the elements um, overall that is that is also advancing this is this whole idea of increasing just daily activity. And what has been happening in more recent times as well is the, is the notion of introducing micro bouts of activity throughout the day. And by the studies that have shown that if you break up, we'll say, sitting time by performing a small amount of activity every 20 or 30 minutes, even for two or three minutes, and you conduct that across the course of the day or part of the day, that that has a substantial benefit on blood glucose levels, not just during the day, but in actual fact, right through the night as well. And that really is also helping us to advance the way we think about exercise, which is that more formal and structured approach, and physical activity, which is just replacing sedentary time with more um, physical activity. And I suppose what this also points to is really exercise, if exercise were a drug, it would be a, a, a wonder drug. But it also points to not just uh, exercise in uh, a period of uh, life in which someone has already developed diabetes, but it's very firmly pointing to a public health approach where people are much more active earlier in their lives as a way of preventing diabetes. Yes, the, the prevention of diabetes is a major challenge that uh, obviously everyone recognizes and the prevalence of diabetes is increasing. Um, and the, the best way we have of stopping that is to try and prevent people from developing the disease in the first place. And exercise does play a very important role in that whole process. Um, and what we've seen with some of the diabetes prevention studies, um, that, you, that diabetes is possible to prevent in a significant proportion of people. And the type of activity that's undertaken is not substantially different to what a lot of the general recommendations for physical activity for the general population are. So we, we have an opportunity through public health messages in order to try and get people more physically active. And that will have a major contribution, not only to just general public health, but also to the prevention of disease and those that are progressing that already are at high risk. Now, we've got a number of uh, presentations here at EASD this year, which are focusing on a dramatic reduction in calories. I mean, Roy Taylor, for instance, is talking about a dramatic reduction in calories in order to, to reverse uh, diabetes. And I wonder if you thought that that meant that this very important part uh, of a prevention of diabetes might be somehow put into the shade, that people would forget about the exercise bit and just think it was about getting you know, calories below 800 for a while and losing a lot of their weight? Yeah, well, physiology is always best studied in extremes. And therefore, as a, as a part of that, you know, looking at very low calorie diets is an extreme way of doing things. And scientifically, these elements are, are always very interesting to explore to try and get a better understanding of how the body responds to different circumstances. And of course, there is always this debate as well about whether exercise is better than diet or diet is better than exercise. The, the approach I like to take with it is that ultimately both elements are necessary in order to have a successful outcome. Calorie restriction is certainly going to be a very powerful way of assisting with weight reduction uh, because you have a greater capacity in order to be able to eliminate calories from your diet than most people have for expending calories through physical activity or exercise. However, we also have to think about what the other side of it means and what does exercise do. And sometimes people get maybe a little too caught up with the idea of exercise being used for weight loss. We know that one bout of exercise will improve insulin sensitivity and that that lasts for somewhere between 24 and 48 hours. There's very little else can do that. Um, and even from a dietary restriction perspective, it won't happen that quickly. We also know that exercise can help to enhance or at least maintain our muscle mass. And we also, the, the, muscle, the amount of muscle that we have also is the engine by which the glucose can be burned and taken up by the action of insulin. So 
with the immediate effect that exercise can have in terms of glucose utilization in the body, the prolonged effect it can have in terms of insulin sensitivity, glycemic control, and the contribution that it can make to weight management and weight loss means that exercise also plays a very important role in the whole treatment and management of patients with diabetes. But it's not to exclude or to try and make it sound better or indeed less important than nutrition. They both have an important role to play. And for some people, looking at uh, some people for nutritional elements will work better. And for others, and we've seen this also in some prevention studies, some people prefer to do more exercise and find it difficult to make substantial changes in their diet. And ultimately, what we're looking for people to do is to try and introduce changes that they can sustain in the long term, because we all realize that we can make short term changes and they can work in the short term. But we need longer term changes in order to have the long term benefit of risk reduction and better diabetes management. I mean, you're absolutely right about exercise being seen as often as a route to weight loss. And then you look at how many miles you'd have to run to run off one Kit Kat. Other chocolate bars are available, but <laughs> one Kit Kat. Yeah. And it's like six miles. And you think this is never going to work. So maybe we have to sell exercise in really a different way. And as you suggest, not as a means of weight loss, but actually a means of diabetes prevention and do it that way around rather than think of it as weight loss. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 it's all about, I suppose, the expectations of any lifestyle intervention program, whether it be exercise or diet. And I think there's no doubt that uh, most patients with diabetes especially type 2 diabetes, weight loss is an important part of, um, I suppose, their lifestyle change. But if we think about it and our prioritization from a diabetes perspective, the, mo the, the most important thing, first of all, is to help to improve glycemic control. And, and we know that exercise can do that immediately, even with one bout of exercise. And it's not just the glucose levels. We know that the lipid levels, like the triglycerides, will also come down very quickly uh, with reasonably regular exercise. But even that can happen in a relatively short period of time. So you have the benefits on the glucose and you have the benefits on the, the lipid side of things. And longer term benefits in terms of maybe blood pressure change and blood pressure control. So we can certainly sell it in terms of the what it can do in terms of the contribution to the management of patients with diabetes. Certainly in that uh, stage of improving glycemic control, that's very important. I think generally... We, when we're looking at lifestyle modification of patients with diabetes, our first priority should be to improve their glycemic control. And weight loss, while it does have an important role, and especially you know, some of the, 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 the bariatric surgery studies have shown what a powerful role uh, weight loss can have, we also still have to realize that there are a number of different goals that can be set. And we can achieve quite a lot for patients by just using exercise to help with their glycemic control and using other methods and other uh, ways of helping them with weight loss and weight reduction. And, and let's not forget that there are many positive side effects of exercise, uh, improved mood, uh, improved uh, well-being. Uh, often people take exercise in company with friends, so it's sociable. So there are lots of things going for exercise. And I wonder what you would say to the average clinician about exercise. So imagine that you, you have a moment to, to you know, make your exercise pitch. What would you say to the average clinician treating diabetes, either a GP or uh, in hospital? Okay, so, in, in, and this is the way I answered this question um, uh, generally, is that the clinicians have very little time on their hands, uh, usually, and they try and give the best to their patients and the best information to their patients. So, in the first instance, while we want exercise to be useful for everyone, really the, the group that I encourage physicians to try and target are those that are relatively newly diagnosed in the first year or two. What we've seen in the past is that if we can get those patients to exercise, generally the response that they get is more impactful and quicker. So if we can get them in, if we can get them at the earlier stages, we can generally have a bigger impact for them. And that also prevents those patients 
from going on and uh, their glycemic control may be getting worse over time or them developing further complications so that the exercise can have a dual benefit of helping to control the diabetes and helping to prevent further complications. We, we've also seen that, again, generally those that have reasonable glycemic control also tend to do better. So, you know, we can get a bigger impact from uh, and with those individuals. So, and the, the third element of it is that, well, if we can identify patients that are at risk of developing type 2 diabetes, that is the time to intervene. And they are the people that are worth investing that time in, in order to stop them getting um, diabetes in the first instance, and then all of the, the, the subsequent comorbidities associated with diabetes. So in other words, the earlier we can get people, the better, either pre-diabetes at high risk, or in the earlier stages of um, them being diagnosed with diabetes, we can have the most impact there. And it's not to say that diabetes won't benefit those other groups, but the return ultimately in terms of their investment in time will be much more significant in those groups. And um, finally, I've got, uh, I've asked you to, uh, to uh, say what you'd say to clinicians, but I'd also ask you what message you would give to policymakers, because it seems to me that public policy around these matters is very important. What would you say to a policymaker? Well, when you look at it from a, a policy perspective, the prevention or the treatment of diabetes isn't really separated from many of the other, what you might call diseases that are affected by lifestyle. In other words, we need to, from a policy perspective, to promote more physical activity throughout our lives generally. So, and in this way, many of the goals and the objectives of climate change can very much parallel and match with some of the goals of chronic disease prevention and treatment from a lifestyle perspective. We need to try and encourage more physical activity into our daily lives whether that's facilitating it through transportation mechanisms, whether it's facilitating housing and city designs, um, whether it's in, in terms of the, the way in which the, the, the infrastructure is, is put together and funded. All of these are policy decisions that will influence the way and the manner in which we can undertake physical activity. So from that perspective, I encourage uh, policymakers to think about you know, the, the climate change goals and the health goals collectively, because by, by tackling those issues, we ultimately will also tackle both of these problems. So it's a good investment overall for not just for our people, but also for our planet. Donald O'Gorman, thank you so much. And I think I'm going to be walking home tonight with some very brisk very exercise. <laughs> In the evening. In the evening, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Back soon.